Of course, Ben Caldercott is the consummate choreographer, so to encourage everyone to come back from lunch and to stay for the second half, uh, he invited a big hitter to join us to kick things off. Uh, after lunch. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, David Craig uh, with us uh, to kick off this afternoon and indeed um, the first panel. David will be uh, a stranger, at least by name and reputation, to very few in the room. As many will know, he's the co-chair of a task force for nature-related financial disclosures, which has over 40 members right across the financial sector, corporates and market services, with collectively about 20 trillion uh, in assets under management. And the TNFD works to deliver uh, risk management and disclosure frameworks for organizations to report and act on uh, evolving uh, nature risks. Of course, many will know uh, that David's uh, background in the world of finance uh, and data uh, has few equals. He was the founder and CNO, CEO of a company that became Refinitiv, uh, a bedrock of the financial uh, information architecture around the world. Uh, and about two and a half, three years ago, uh, Refinitiv uh, came together with the London Stock Exchange Group, as many will know, uh, and David stayed there uh, for a while. And then around about two years ago, uh, uh, left uh, to, as he said to me uh, in, the, uh, in, the co in, the, in the lunch break, uh, well, to do a few um, uh, part-time jobs like TNFD, which was sold to you, I think, David, as a two-day-a-month job. Uh, which is currently evidently about a four day a week uh, job um, amongst the other sort of seven or eight things that you're trying to cram in. But um, David, it is absolutely wonderful uh, to have you with us today and look forward to uh, the latest update from TNFD. Thank you, David. Well, thank you very much, Rowan. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you all today on the topic of assessing nature-related financial risk. I don't think I qualify as a, a big hitter, as Rowan described me, but I'll try and do my best to explain this challenge and this problem and how we're breaking down this challenge so it's fixable. Um, I really welcome the work of the CDFI in establishing, helping to establish the UK as a centre of expertise for greening the financial system. And I hope this morning's sessions, which unfortunately I couldn't make on net zero transition planning scenarios were productive, um, and I thank you for the chance to speak today, um, specifically around the nature and data challenges. And I'm really looking forward to joining the panel um, in a moment and taking part in that. But I do worry that the topic of nature um, and becoming nature positive is too often after lunch. Um, the morning is all about climate and how we're doing on transition plans. And, and then someone rings me up and says, well, we want to do the next things now. And we think that nature's next. Um, and it's as if, you know, these are sequential issues and we look at planet Earth and Mother Earth and, and Mother Earth doesn't put these as sequential issues. They're both happening um, at the same time. But of course, we live in a practical world where we fill the morning's agenda first and then the afternoon and we're squeezing in busy agendas. But it is coming clear to many of us, to business and finance, that the idea that nature and climate are separate and you can do one before the other is flawed thinking. We cannot be net zero unless we're nature positive, and it is clear that we are possibly at or beyond the limit of destroying the very natural ecosystems that are fundamental infrastructures to our economies and financial markets. And it's not just the scientists that are clearly warning us, but it's the economists and central bankers that are also doing that now too, as you heard from the ECB last week. And we really not need to start thinking, as Professor Dasgupta told us to, of nature as an infrastructure, as an asset that we need to value, we need to invest in, and we need to stop destroying. But why are people realizing this? And people are realizing this because nature risks are materializing faster and quicker than many of the climate-only scenarios predicted. Think of the examples that hit the front page of the newspapers every day, droughts, adverse weather in Europe, North Africa, California. These are damaging food production, harvests, food prices, food inflation, chronic water shortages from the Colorado Basin to now Scotland, to European rivers that impact logistics or cooling of nuclear power stations. Pretty much every day we're seeing the issues arising that are not just natural issues but are economic issues because that natural ecosystem that we rely on so much is underfunded and under-resourced.
And I've had conversations with UK banks this week, last week, about their worry of their exposure to UK farming and how this is going to manifest itself out. And I think there's a beginning to be a massive awareness of this as a problem here in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Australia, in the US, around the world. And many companies, including those on the task force, are finding that these physical and transition risks are materialising faster than we expected with the detrimental impacts that I described. We're also learning something else. We are learning that nature is our strongest tool and weapon to fight climate change. In March 22, the IPBS body of scientists estimated that preserving nature, changing how we cultivate and use the land, how we farm, how we produce and consume our food and what food we take, how we look after livestock, they estimated that if we took relatively low cost measures on a global scale, we could absorb or reduce the emissions of 13.5 gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That's a big number. It's 13 times what they estimated we could achieve by decarbonizing transport. And it's more than all of the changes to industry and buildings, built manufacturers together. So they're basically saying we're destroying the most valuable asset that we have to fight climate change Yet, where's the money going? Is the money going into physical assets or is it going into our natural ecosystem and that infrastructure as an asset that I talked about? Just one example, if you took just the top few centimetres of soil around the world, a big amount of soil, and you treated it properly, it could actually absorb, actually absorb all of the man-made carbon. It could do so if we took the right methods and we provided the right financial incentives to do so. But the investment is not going in that. A fraction of investment flows into alternative production methods, and a small fraction, around 20% of the estimated 800 billion per year required to preserve natural systems is in place today. And this is because our financial system, which many of us work in and many of us believe in, has a flaw. Natural ecosystems, that asset class I talked about, are priced effectively zero, whilst a forest, a bed of seagrass, or a peat area can contribute huge value to our economic system. It costs little or nothing to remove or destroy them, and you'll rarely see them, if at all, on the balance sheet. And the second flaw is that our rather short-term investment strategies value more dependable revenues, not important innovation and change. And yes, I do think this issue is important, people say, but maybe I'll deal with it in the next financial year, not this one. Yet shareholders, Asset managers, fund owners are beginning to realise they're sitting on unquantified and major external risk, and they're sitting potentially, having invested in, a whole bunch of stranded assets. So, this is the primary goal of the TNFD. We want to create a global framework to help these companies and financial institutions assess, manage and report on nature-related financial risks and opportunities, ultimately being able to redirect financial flows away from things that harm our natural ecosystem and that infrastructure, but to what we call nature positive outcomes. And of course, we have to address this sometimes perceived, but sometimes real issue of complexity. After all, riding a bike can be incredibly complex, but we break it down, we learn by doing, and we achieve this huge goal. So we have to stop the excuse that I hear time and time again that oh, it's just too complicated. Why isn't there one metric for nature? And there's not enough data. These are excuses that TNFD is trying to break down and show people that actually riding a bike, whilst physically very complicated, is actually more simple to do. And how to do that? We're supported by eight amazing governments around the world, UN agencies, several philanthropic organisations. They fund us, but we're run by the market for the market. We're supported by the GFI platform, who do a tremendous job supporting a small central global team, but a team that has enormous reach. And we're creating something that is designed, that is validated and tested by market participants around the world, and market participants who are stepping forward and putting themselves on the front line of this challenge. And we've made substantial progress since our start in September 2021, just 18 months ago. We have now completed the official consultation on June the 1st for our fourth beta release. We released four releases in a very fast, rapid software type iteration. Much of the work was done online. 
We've established over 1,100 forum member organizations, 1,100 companies and scientific bodies, financial institutions inside the TNFD with a task force of 40. And we're carrying out over 200 pilot tests here in the UK, supported by the GFI, in Brazil, in Asia, in Latin America, um, in the US, many, many parts of the world, looking at areas like palm oil, mineral extraction, agriculture, textiles, with fascinating learnings and feedback about what it takes to do this. We have 3,500 pieces of feedback analyzed. We've had nearly a million downloads of the framework. So clearly, we've got a huge amount of momentum. And that feedback is being considered evaluated ahead of the publication in September 2023. In fact, the team and the task force are all in Paris for two days this week, opening up this feedback and trying to understand what are things that are designed to try and make this perfect versus what are things that we need to do to ensure adoption. The support on capability building will continue. One of the lessons we learned from TCFD, we modeled ourselves on our cousin, borrowing the framework and the lessons and the tools that they had developed was that actually addressing things like capability building earlier on were really important. If we spent as much time on training as we did arguing about taxonomies, I think we'd have a much faster approach to net zero than we do today. But we also recognize the importance of data. I am a self-confessed data geek. Um, I love the stuff. It's amazingly powerful. It can open up all sorts of insights and opportunities. So we have over 130 data companies in our data catalyst understanding where the gaps are, be they spatial gaps or maybe temporal gaps, um, increasing the approach to standardization and transparency. How do we measure the state of nature of a piece of land or ocean or shoreline in a consistent way? And putting guidance on where to find local data sources so that we can stop the companies and financial institutions who sometimes they sort of expect a Refinitiv or even a Bloomberg screen to pop up and tell them the nature answer. Well, it's not going to do that. They have to go out and find the data. They have to do the work. So I'll finish by saying what's actually in the framework. What will you see when you go online, like many of you, I'm sure, have and done this and looked at this? Um, there are three components plus supplementary guidance. Um, first of all, there's definitional work on how do we talk and describe nature. We talk about four realms of our natural system and 34 distinct biomes areas of land or water characterized by specific types of ecosystem services. Really important that we have a common language for interfacing between the world of science and nature, business and finance. We then have a methodology to many people, not everyone, nature assessment is new. Many people, many companies have been doing this for many years. We codified their approach. We call it LEAP. It stands for locate, evaluate, assess and prepare. It helps you step through the approach of looking at your value change and understanding where things are being made and the types of ecosystem services dependencies that you have. And then finally, the recommended disclosures modeled on the four TCFD pillars. We've copied them across. Enormously strong feedback for doing that, but of course added the specific elements of nature like location and supply chains and societal input that are so important. And additional guidance includes guidance on sectors, on biomes, on scenario analysis, there's no point in doing separate climate scenarios. You should do climate and nature together as we are learning and we're working with the NGFS on doing that. And a lot of guidance true around setting targets and metrics. We're working with the science-based targets for nature. And breaking down that complexity, those four realms that I talked about, atmosphere, land, ocean, freshwater, then break down into 34 biomes, trying to almost segment the world into those areas based on scientific knowledge of distinct ecosystem characteristics. A coastal system is very different from a savanna, which is very different from high productive agricultural land. Your impact potentially on water or pollution or land change use is very different. So it's really important to have that kind of definitional work to do that. And as you can understand from as I'm speaking, the implications of this are that you have to really understand not what you do as a company or where you're investing, but where those locations really are on a pretty granular level. And therein lies the data challenge that I'm sure we'll cover later um, in the panel. So TNFD is not a standard. We're a market task force. We're designing something and recommending an approach and a tool for the market by the market. We are then hoping and working to have that built into the standards that emerge through the global standard of the ISSB, 
through the EU, through national regulations such as the UK or SEC or others around the world. We're also aligning to the global biodiversity framework that was agreed in Kuming in Montreal. Um, I was there, my co-chair Elizabeth Remner is actually the secretariat, so we had a ringside seat to those discussions. And I think it's really important that we don't just celebrate what was achieved there in the landmark breakthrough of those 23 targets. But we have a methodology and a tool set that demonstrates that we can get there. So what happens next? Um, busy summer, processing all the feedback, supporting more pilot tests, supporting more members. And then in September, we'll launch our recommendations to the market. But of course, the work doesn't stop there. There will be ongoing pilots and testing. There will be further industry guidance. There'll be further collaboration with the ISSB, the EU, and others to embody the approach and the TNFD into them. Um, we will also be making recommendations. We are supported by the G20 Sustainable Finance Group. We'll be making recommendations for a more open public data sharing approach to accelerate the way that data can be formed. And we'll also be encouraging and supporting adoption. Many companies and financial institutions have already committed to adopt the TNFD or do so in the future, already starting to even use parts of the early drafts. Companies like AXA, Santander, UBS, corporates such as GSK, Kieran, ABM, have all indicated their future path to use the framework, and it's the start, I hope, of many. I'm a huge believer in financial markets. I think they do immense good. They direct finance and money to invest, schools, bridges, infrastructure, the things that we rely on as people. What I hope that we can do through the TNFD is redirect financial markets so they invest into the infrastructure that they've taken for granted for the last 150 years, which is possibly the most important. And that's the infrastructure of our natural ecosystem. We can't keep nature to the after lunch slot. We've got to keep it in the morning and we've got to embed climate as part of nature, not the other way around. The planet doesn't see these as separate job titles. If I look at the companies and the financial institutions that are leading, they're merging their climate and nature teams. They're merging their approach to TCFD and TNFD. And they're thinking about this in a holistic approach. So I would just encourage all of you to think in an integrated, organized, and cohesive approach to nature and climate together. And believe in that the financial markets can redirect finance into more nature positive outcomes. Thank you very much. Rowan, I'm happy to take questions here. Yeah, I was just going to ask, I'm sure, uh, David, uh, thanks so much. Uh, we've got time for some questions. Uh, I, I know uh, it is afterwards, but you picked up so many of the themes from uh, this morning around you know, the need to, to retrain the invisible hand. I also I thought your comment right at the end about thinking about climate as actually part of nature, <coughs> the other way around, because obviously it's a very big set of ecosystem services, but it's just one set of natural ecosystem services and I can certainly see that that convergence and almost nature takeover if I may say David <laughs> happening. Uh, any questions from the floor? Well, please don't be shy. I'll kick off with one. Obviously David you know here there's an audience of finance sector folks, thank you, finance sector folks, academia, NGOs and government. Um, if you've got an ask or two of, of these communities right now as you've said, you've just launched the fourth iteration, I think, of the... Any particular asks for the second <coughs> half of the year uh, to help you and your very busy team? I can see why you're working four days a week, by the way. <laughs> uh, to, to help you drive the agenda forward. Well, I think um, two things, not one. For financial institutions and corporations, uh, start. Um, we can't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Um, we can't let, wait for perfect regulations to arrive that tell us what to do, because if you don't start, that will have enormous impact on the risk that you're carrying. Uh, it will also mean that you're behind the curve and you won't have hired the talent and the people and done the training that's required. And then for the NGO community um, and the supporters that we have, um, recognize too that this is a journey. The TNFD, whilst we've made tremendous progress, is only a start. We can't solve all of the issues and we can't be perfect. We've defined 15 disclosures, um, one of which is climate, so really 14 in the realm of nature. Um, many scientific bodies and NGOs would like us to have 3,000 disclosures. They'd like to know what the CEO had for breakfast and that to be disclosed in the morning. 
And I understand sometimes that this mindset of if you disclose everything, we'll find you out. The financial industry and corporates would be overwhelmed by that and we'd never have any progress because no one would adopt it. So we've got to find that sensible middle. Uh, my success is that financial institutions say there are too many and NGOs and scientific groups say there's not enough. We're, we're in that middle, middle ground. But, you know, if I can just give you one piece of feedback, we, in the 15 areas, the 14 on nature, um, resource use, pollution, um, land use, oceans, you can go through and have a look. You know, very strong feedback. I'm not giving it away that plastic pollution should be as, as, as one of those in there. And I think there's a very good case and lots of voices that say this is such a critical issue, uh, not just for the environment and our economies, but our own bloodstreams, which is being polluted by microplastics, we should deal with this. So I think that's a good example of where this feedback and input is really working and helping. Thank you, Doug. I think there's a question in the middle there. Yes, thank you. Na name and affiliation. Uh, thanks. It's Adam Young, Tech UK. I was just wondering if you had any concerns that this climate first approach that's being pursued could actually have negative implications for nature, that certain climate solutions are actually anti-nature anti -nature solutions. Well, it can, and it is, and it's not just climate first, it's climate only. Um, so if you go and buy an offset, which is just replanting a singular forest, it's well known for years and well publicized, that doesn't help biodiversity in nature, it can destroy the downstream ecosystem integrity, all sorts of issues. So you have to think about, and particularly in the world of offsets, where you're investing in often natural solutions, how am I thinking about biodiversity in nature um, in the way that I'm, that I'm doing it? So climate first, climate only is, is definitely an issue um, and leading us to the wrong actions to get there. What people actually are realizing, the more enlightened, is that actually nature first helps climate. And that actually if I think about different ways of farming, for example, um, I can actually really reduce my CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions like methane by using different methods. So we mustn't make this a battle between climate and nature. Mother Earth will be very cross with us if we do that. We have to think about Mother Earth helping us. She's given us this amazing tool to fight the damage that we've done with nature. So we have to think about climate and atmosphere as part of nature. I think there's two questions, let's take them all, and then David, you can answer all of them, whichever ones you want. So the gentleman there, the lady down here at the front, and uh, Andrew uh, at the front. We'll sort of take all the questions and then, uh, and then we'll break. Thanks, Benjamin Simpson from Osmosis Investment Management. Uh, I just wondered if we could interrogate just the framing of nature under TNFD and as an ecosystem service framing. Uh, you mentioned about alignment with the GBF, which is obviously great. Do you see any potential conflict into the future with um, regulations that might serve to concern species that aren't related to ecosystem services or indeed provide ecosystem disservices? Can you just give one example of species, not just so that we all lost? Uh, for disservices? Yeah. Anyone who's got hay fever at the moment <laughs> is an ecosystem disservice. Got it. Thank right. you so much. We can just come to the question again. We'll take all three and then. Um, Dinesha Mendes, Newberger Berman. Um, David, first of all, thank you very much. Um, secondly, what's your view on um, the skills gap that we have across all sectors for the dialogue to take place? I mean, I'm, I work for a large institutional asset manager. Um, I see the CFA Institute launching certificates in ESG and climate risk that tackle investment, the investment side of it. Um, but I'd like to hear your view on that. There is a panel after this, so lots of time. <clears throat> Andrew Ross from Global Garden. As well as describing the problem, are you providing a methodology for valuing nature in terms that institutional financial investors on the bond market can invest in directly? Good, three very good questions. I'm going to tackle them in reverse order, and I'll do the hay fever one at the end. Um, so we are working closely with a number of groups looking at valuation of natural assets, include, including Capital Coalition. Um, we haven't tried to step into the complex world of putting a value on a tree or a natural asset um, because it's very complicated um, and also because you can get various different answers to the value of that asset depending how you look at it. What we are in effect trying to do is by going through the methodology and the assessment is incorporating the 
characteristics of that asset on your business model. So what are my ecosystem services that I depend upon and what are the impacts that I might be having? So we've tried to stay more practical. There are some serious brains working on natural capital um, asset valuation, particularly in the asset management world, and I think we should let them do their job. We haven't tried to solve that problem. Um, your question on the bond market is a really interesting one. We have so far looked at essentially the equity market of public companies, but of course, the framework can be transposed into the bond market in a relatively straightforward way. In fact, one government has actually just applied the TNFD approach to value their bond. So one of the things that we will be doing after September is looking at both corporate and government debt and trying to understand how TNFD can be applied. Uh, and we're also working with the development banks. So trillions of dollars go into development banks around the world. Much of it's actually harmful for nature in the form of subsidies or projects. We're also working with them on how that can be changed. It's a big part of the equation um, to do it. So hopefully I've answered your question. The training question. Uh, yes, I am worried about this because um, I think if you open the box on many companies, let's say one of, a lot of our members in the agricultural space or these areas, they've actually been looking at this for a long time. Um, and their skills are relatively developed on how to assess at a location-based nature-related risks and impacts. Um, the mining industry, for example, it, let's face it, doesn't always have a good record on this, has always had to do, depending on which part of the world, but generally, um, environmental assessment impact into quite a detailed level. So if you actually talk to our mining members, they'd actually say this isn't that new for us. The biggest skills gap is actually in financial markets. Um, and that's where in the asset management world in particular, there is a big skills gap of this area. Uh, one of our members early on said success for me, this is a big US asset manager, was my portfolio managers know enough to understand how to quantify nature related risk in their portfolios. That was a good challenge to us. Um, so I think there's training required, and that's where the biggest gap is. Um, and I do worry that everyone gets trained on climate because the training companies think that's the next thing to sell. And then next year they'll say, well, now let's, let's train you on nature, back to this point about climate only. That's why we're working on a platform approach to have third parties work with us to create something comprehensive that is nature and climate together um, to do it. Um, the detrimental services, the hay fever example, um, I would not pretend for a moment to be an expert on the natural system to understand where some of those consequences might lie. What I do think though is by going through this approach, um, what we are going to find as financial investors and asset managers is there's no perfect answer and that we're going to have to be making trade-offs. Um, imperfect information leads to the wrong trade-offs and the wrong decisions. By um, adopting TNFD, and going through those assessment metrics, there are about 3,000 of them, and then the disclosure metrics, you're making visible to the asset managers the trade-offs. Am I trading off you know, destruction of land because I need to mine lithium to fuel electrification of cars, but I, I understand that trade-off and I've minimized it? Uh, or am I prioritizing one thing over another? So I think at the moment, our biggest challenge is we don't know what trade-offs we're making. They're implicit, and we need to make them explicit so we understand that I don't suffer from hay fever, my son does, um, and it's a very good example of something that could be detrimental. I'm sure when we reverse the bee population decline, which is a staggering issue, I'm sure some lobby group will say that more people are being stung and going to hospital and there's all sorts of issues, but you know, such is life, right? Anytime, let no good deed go unforgiven is the way that I think about this. Thank you. David, thanks so much for covering uh, all those questions. Um, so now, as you know, risk is about choice. So you know how some risk will be. I'm going to go into two separate channels. If you want to carry on uh, with David and others in a panel uh, led by Joanna McRae, we're going to be looking at uh, the data requirements for, for nature positive finance here in this room on this panel. So stay where you are. Alternatively, pop downstairs to the Godfrey Theatre, where uh, UKRI will be presenting uh, eight companies who have been members of their group that have been invested in as, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as partner startups or, or developing companies in the area of climate and environmental data science. So uh, there we go. We'll uh, give folks a couple of minutes to uh, make their decision head downstairs. And with that, Joanna, I'll hand over to you. But finally, one more round of applause, please, for David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great.